Okay, I have a question to ask just as I sort of uh, start off here. I think I know everyone, if I don't, my name is uh, Davey. Um, when Professor Schwartz was uh, talking just now, and I was listening to him, most of what he said, not all of it, did he say randomly in the middle of a sentence, Pirates of the Caribbean? <laughs> he did, right? Good. Because I thought I imagined that as I was sitting there. But he did say that, didn't he? Okay, great. Why did you say Pirates of the Caribbean? Because there's a scene in which the damsel in distress says, but what about the Pirates Code? The Pirates Code, well, we think of them more as... Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, right. Okay, great. I feel, I feel better for knowing that now. I thought, I thought it was going crazy. Uh, okay, hang on a second. <laughs> Okay, we can't see that very well, eh? Maybe is it because the lights are on, or? Is it just, oh, it just needs to heat up a little bit? Okay, cool. All right, all right, well, now we've got the Pirates of the Caribbean out of the way. Uh, we'll see if, uh, can I turn that light off, or no? Is there a way to do that? Lisa, do you know, or? Just because it's kind of hard to. Can everyone see it okay? Yeah? Okay. Oh, there we go. That's, yeah, that's awesome. Okay, that's great. Let's go. Film okay? Yeah, it's all right. Okay, excellent. Uh, I'm much better in the dark, generally. Um, okay, so what we'll talk about is a sort of amalgam of uh, a number of different uh, areas, I suppose, uh, as uh, Professor Schwartz was saying, regarding uh, criminal trials and specifically eyewitness identification, but more generally sort of perception and, and memory as it relates to uh, a criminal uh, trial and how much weight we place on that, uh, not just as lawyers but as a, as a society in terms of trying to um, resolve disputes by way of what people remember uh, from previous events, which is essentially our system uh, that we have. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about sort of the modern day trial uh, as a mechanism of, of storytelling, right? As, as how we actually relate stories, how we tell stories to one another, because that's essentially what trials are. Uh, and uh, that fits within the sort of rubric of what, what Brian was talking about there. Talk about a couple of uh, sort of cultural implications to some of the uh, work that I do in uh, both in the classroom and, and empirically talking about sort of my perceptions, which are uh, uh, biased as well in some of the stuff that I teach. So talk a little bit about that. And then talk a bit about some of the frailties of eyewitness testimony, specifically although memory in general, um, in terms of what the, the social science literature uh, is telling us as lawyers that we have to be careful of. Uh, and then talk about uh, some wrongful convictions uh, that sort of feature uh, prominently with, uh, with uh, our friend here, the lineup, uh, be it a physical lineup or show up as used to be. It's the greatest graphic ever. I stole that. Uh, John Birchall uses it in the presentation. It was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. And I, um, and uh, we'll talk a little about about two or three different wrongful convictions that are, that are then we'll just have a general, hopefully a discussion uh, about some of the things that we've talked about uh, and see if we can come to terms. And I want to sort of propose a couple of things uh, that are sort of going on at the moment. There's somewhat of a a battle that seemed to be dead that seems to have come back up in Manitoba now, asking about whether expert evidence should be admissible to explain to people why eyewitness identification is so bad, potentially, why it's so frail. Uh, that's just come up in, in Mohammed, uh, in our case called Woodard uh, in about 2009. Those are cases that we can talk a little bit about. Uh, so that's kind of where we are. So if I can start just talking a little bit about sort of trial advocates and just positioning what we're, what we're talking about. <clears throat> Typically, uh, you're using lots of different forms and types of evidence to prove a case, but typically you're using uh, viva voce witness testimony in court. That's how most information is imparted. So it's very important that the information that we hear from people, we have some way to assess, and uh, Professor Schwartz talked about this off the top, whether or not someone's telling the truth, whether they're perceiving something correctly, whether relating it correctly, is the way they communicate that evidence uh, important, uh, it seems to be. So the ability to effectively examine people 
uh, both direct and cross-examination, can make a big difference in how evidence comes out and whether or not we can say that evidence is real, true, factual, not factual. So we hopefully remain uh, important in that, uh, in that thing. Oh, oh, look at this. I didn't know it did this. Okay, the very nature of the evidence, this is an impediment to truth. This must be, there must be some really zingers in here because I, yeah, I like it. Facts are usually defined by the way witness testimony, we know that. Okay, so witness knowledge, something that a witness comes to tell us, because evidence is purely about information. That's all it's about. Courts receiving information from people, either by documents, by real evidence, by what people say. So people's knowledge isn't really knowledge when we start to unpack the uh, social science literature. It's really someone's belief, and it's someone's belief about what somebody now remembers, perhaps, or some social sciences will argue always incorrectly or imperfectly, right? About an event that happened in the often quite distant years measure past, right? So that's more, and this is an uncomfortable place for us to live, right? We don't like to think of the system like that because it doesn't seem like it's very stable anymore, okay? It's not exactly what somebody knows anymore. It's what their sort of perception of that event was in the first place and how that perception affects their memory as it goes by, often for long periods of time. And then if we think that trier of fact has to unpack that and make a decision, that trier of fact is basing their belief in their decision on what witnesses believe they remembered and on how they communicated that belief. The comments off the top about demeanor evidence, as we call it sort of globally, are very true. We are horrible at knowing whether somebody is telling the truth or not, like really quite terrible. And in fact, there's research out there that says lawyers are worse than other people, right? So there's really a, a belief that we all kind of prop up as a legal fiction that we prop up the system with by saying, well, if we can see somebody, we can give deference to trial judges because they can see witnesses. But actually that's not borne out by, by how we actually do with that. Many people can look like they're telling the truth and aren't, and vice versa, right? In life, we all, we all have that, because identifying himself, we all have that uh, experience in our own human experience, right? So it should be no different in court. <clears throat> but I just want people to sort of position that, like remember that sort of what I've termed our global frailty of the system. Like the system is already kind of shaky, right? And within that shakiness, we're gonna look specifically at sort of, uh, sort of memory. So before we do that, uh, we'll talk a little bit, just very quickly about persuasion and, and script because they're important sort of uh, um, mechanisms by which we can uh, position the, the memory stuff. So what we do as lawyers in a court is to persuade people. The exercise of influence on the decision of others, we try and persuade a trier of fact, a judge, a jury, a tribunal, whoever it is, as to your particular version of events. The act of questioning witnesses then becomes very important because we want to try and articulate that version of events as best that we can for our client's legal position. Examining witnesses then is our primary mechanism of storytelling and that's all a trial is. You're running a story and the other counsel is running a story and you want to try or fact to tell your story at the end of the day. Right? not the other person's. Now, it's a very simplified way of looking at it, but it's essentially what it is. So, I've done this before uh, with some people who have been in my classes. It's a really nice way to kind of uh, illustrate uh, a point that the social scientists can give more, uh, more heft to, and that's script theory. So you see the words that are on the page, tickets, summer blockbuster, and popcorn, okay? So those words, if everyone reads those words, and processes those words, what you should be thinking about when you've done that is a movie theater, right? Like that's the idea, is that you're thinking about a movie theater and you're not thinking about just any movie theater, you're thinking about a movie theater that means something to you. It might be the last theater you went to, it might be a theater you went to when you were a kid, that's the one I think about in Edinburgh, I think about the Dominion Cin Cinema in Edinburgh that I used to go to um, as a child. I don't know why, but that's the one that pops into my head when I think about movie theaters. So I don't have to tell you movie theater 
because you'll script that for me, right? You take information, this is how we all process information, you take information and you fill in blanks with it. Because as a people, as a race, a human race, we're impatient. We don't want to wait for the punchline, right? Like we want to process that information and get out ahead of it because that's how we construct our world, right? So because of that, it becomes really, really important uh, when we look at a trial as a storytelling mechanism that we, if we can control some of how this information impacts with the trial, we can to some degree control a script that will run for a trial of fact, right? We're using this sort of very easy example, but we start to get into a bigger world of psychology when we start to think about what does this actually mean? What this actually means is because we're rushing ahead and filling in these blanks, we've got to be very careful about how they're filled in because we'll fill them in in different ways depending on the words and the narrative that's given to us. Generally speaking, we tend to believe things that make sense to us, right? So if we present or process information in a certain way and it makes sense to us, then we tend to think it's more true, okay? So if I said to you, I went to the movie theater and I had a snack, okay? then you're probably going to fill in for me that I'm eating popcorn, all the crap you eat in the movie theater, right? Popcorn, sweeties, all that kind of stuff, right? And that's fine. That information makes sense to you because you've been to a movie theater, presumably, right? You've been there, you know what kind of snacks they have. I don't have to tell you what I'm having. You'll fill it in. But if I say to you I'm going to a movie theater and I'm going to have carrot sticks and hummus, okay? then what do you do with that information? If you're a trier of fact, I've told you I went to movie theaters, I had a snack, I had some carrot sticks and hummus. Cool. What have you done with that information for me? Uh, I've assumed you're going to the movie Mm-hmm. <laughs> Possibly. Or, uh, you snuck it, I don't know, you or I snuck it in. I snuck it in. That could be it. It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense for our own frame of reference, right? Unless we happen to know about a new health food movie store out there, right, a new theater, and we've laid that foundation for someone, the danger we have, and this comes up more when we talk about memory, is that we'll reject that information. And what we know is that once we've rejected that information, it's very difficult to get that information back in, right? So we have to be very careful uh, as lawyers, as people running trials, to make sure that information isn't rejected because our story, our script, relies on the fact that that information is accepted. So that's a sort of global kind of look um, at what we'll sort of talk further about uh, in terms of our ability to tell stories in a certain way for the benefit of our clients as lawyers, right? Okay. So, let's think about this. All right. <coughs> so Elizabeth Loftus, who's pretty much the main sort of uh, uh, person in this area, along with a, a number of other people, uh, her ex-husband being one, uh, Deborah Davis, a bunch of people that, that write almost exclusively in this idea of perception uh, and uh, memory. As, uh, as it relates to the legal system in particular, <clears throat> has given a number, and over the years this has solidified position, on a number of things which we now believe to be true about how people process information, how they remember information, uh, and to some degree how memory is uploaded and encoded and then uh, downloaded. Um, so people's memories, we believe, can be influenced, altered, or fabricated, they can be made up, right? And this can happen at any number of different stages. <clears throat> what Loftus tells us is that we have essentially three sort of mechanisms here of doing this. We can have selective memory, which we've all been guilty, right? Selective memory or selective failure of memory. 
We can also have a false memory, something that didn't actually happen, something I didn't witness, didn't actually happen to me, but I create a memory of an event that didn't happen. We'll talk about some of the experiments. You can also distort memory. So memories of actual witnessed events, experience, something that you have seen, that you have been part of, you can distort that memory for any number of reasons. And the two major reasons, or I suppose mechanisms by which you can distort them, are what they call schematic and inferential processing, fancy, fancy, or sources of specific misinformation, being told things that allow you to change those memories. Okay? So we'll talk sort of specifically about what some of those things are. <coughs> Elizabeth Lossus is famous for saying that your memory is like a Wikipedia page. Right? And what she means by that is you can change it. You can change your memory and it will change by these processes. We'll explain what those are. But just like a Wikipedia page, so can somebody else, right? So somebody else can change your memory. And that can happen and does happen uh, to people. And what we have to keep our eye on as we talk about some of this stuff is all of the things we're going to talk about over the next few minutes happen before we get anywhere near a courtroom, right? These are things that are happening to people as they interact with events in life, okay? All right, so. <coughs> yeah. Quick example here, your, your Pirates of the Caribbean book. Let's stick on them. So, you just heard that initially as random because you had no context. That's right. Expected. Somebody here might have been in my other classes where I used the same metaphor and they might have immediately processed this, yes, rule not a guideline. When you brought it up, people might say, yes, I thought that was random, or they might now remember that I said it, even though they didn't remember that I actually said it, if you hadn't said it. Uh, and the fact that you called it random might be the way they remember it now. Oh, that was just Professor Schwartz doing another one of his random acts. We call that a primer. Yeah. Gave you a primer, right? I told you it was random. Right. Yeah. Then, after I explained it, when people remember what I initially said, are they going to remember, do they actually remember it in the first place? Or they, they remember, remember the that, stuff? oh yeah, that was <coughs> David pointing out my tendency to use Talk about pirates. widespread uh, references. Or are they going to remember my recollection that it was in the context of code not a guideline and explain yeah. Are they going to remember the initial event or are they going to remember the way it was mediated between our different right. our own recollections and interpretations? Uh, that's just one small little thing where there's not big stakes involved, but then you add a lot of high stakes and a lot of emotion and self-interest and the passage of time. If that one little event could be quite easily interpreted initially in different ways, remembered in different ways, primed in different ways, imagine what could happen if something happens in a bar fight and, yeah. and so on. So um, just want to use that a very small example to I love it. show some of the challenges. Is that deliberate the whole time? No, we should, we should say it was. Yeah, it was. <laughs> no, that's absolutely right. And then one of the major problems becomes you add in time. And you add in time to that entire process and you wait two years between the bar fight and then going to court to talk about the bar fight and you've got some real problems. And as we get to eyewitness identification, we've got some real problems that don't even have to do with memory, just in terms of the, uh, the physical attributes. So, what we're talking about really is what the social scientists call constructive nature of perception and comprehension, right? That we add alter or fabricate or lose memory based on things that are innate to us. So we filter information through particular, and that's what we're talking about here with these schemas of this inferential processing, that we all are preloaded with a number of different life experiences that allow us to, to sort of filter uh, memories. And because of that, it can be a big problem. And this kind of schematic filtering is a problem and it's a necessary thing to make sense of the world, right? Like we all come to every situation with our own set of values, our own set of beliefs, our own set of schematics that run, right? And when we have these, 
we need them to make sense of the world. If we didn't have them, it's difficult to make sense of the world. It's difficult to plan. It's difficult to understand what to do with information that we have. But we do it all the time, right, because we have all these things. So that's something that comes in. And we have different kinds of schemas. So we have category schemas. So within our own perception, we categorize people. We categorize people by race. We categorize people by gender. Right? We categorize people within our experience of the world. Not everybody's categories are the same. And our perceptions of those categories vary right? by what we've been taught, what we've been told, what we believe. We also have personal schemas. How do you feel about an individual? Your relationship with an individual builds up a profile of that individual. And then any information about that individual, you process through that lens or filter or however, schema, however you want to look at it, right? You have self schemas, how you look at yourself. What you think of yourself may not be what other people think about you, right? Often, in fact, it may not be, right? But everyone runs those little programs all the time when they're interacting with, with information. Event schemas, causal schemas, all these things that sort of go on. So these are things that are happening and every piece of information that comes to you, you're looking at through that. And you don't know you're doing it, right? So you're not sitting there going, well, how is my self schema today? How do I feel about myself? Well, usually pretty good, right? You're not making a conscious sort of discussion like that. I mean, you might be, but typically you're not, right? So why is this kind of important for us? So we have these, what they refer to, I suppose, as organized kind of knowledge structures that allow all this information to kind of sift through. And despite the fact that it's necessary, it can lead to systemic errors in that process. Okay? So if we combine all of these little programs or schemas that we're running, we have an overarching schema that's referred to as a narrative schema, and that's a story, right? So that's the way that we all start to process information. We start to tell ourselves stories about it, right? So that we get a nice, compact version of what's going on, and we can use that as we go through. So let's use an example of a police officer stopping you for a traffic ticket. So if we break it down by these schemas, you get pulled over for a traffic ticket. It's not the first time it's happened to you, perhaps. So you have a preloaded traffic stop schema. You know what's going to happen here. He's going to come up. He's going to ask my license, my registration. He's going to give me attitude. I'm going to want to give him attitude, but I probably won't, right? All of that stuff. Now, that schema is going to depend is going to be very different for different people. And it's going to be very different depending on what your experience of being stopped by the cops is like, right? How often does it happen to you? Does it happen to you all the time? Are you getting profiled? Are you getting stopped for no reason, right? You're also running a cop schema. How do you look at police officers? Do you believe police officers are good upstanding citizens who aren't going to tell lies and are going to be wonderful people. Some people believe that, right? Some people don't have that view of police officers. But the point is, the information that happens in that traffic stop, I'm filtering through whichever one I have. And they're all running, right? They're all running. And that's where it gets really interesting. Because if we have all of them running at the same time, then we can start to see all right, let's try and isolate some of them and see how people actually process memory and do they process it differently if they have different schemes, right? So, some examples. So women are thought to have a self-schema that is more concerned with appearance than men. Okay? So they run experiments that show that. Women are also better, empirically, they are better at remembering what people look like than men are. Right? So if you're testing them by gender, 
they're going to have a better idea. So scientists, social scientists are positive that there's a connection between those things. Because the schema of their self is more concerned with appearance, then they're more likely to be able to understand other people's appearance and be able to relay it, right? And that's shown to be the case. I have had, this is not an experiment, and I think I've told some of this before, but I'll tell you again. I have had an experience where um, I had to identify uh, somebody. So, and my wife was there as well. So someone came to our door um, and said they were collecting for a charity. And this actually happened. Someone came to my door, said they were collecting for a charity, and could give them money for a, a tournament, a charity tournament they were collecting for. And the person that came to my door, I opened the door and I saw him. And the person looked familiar to me. Now, in my game, that's a bad thing, generally, right? So the person came to the door who looked somewhat sketchy. I thought, oh, uh, why do I recognize this person? Uh, this probably isn't going to go well. And he said, hi, I'm so-and-so. And I said, hi, so-and-so. And he said, I'm your neighbor. I live at this number on your street. And I thought to myself, phew, that's why I know you, right? Like, I'm, I'm now, I'm, it's making sense. Like, I thought you were a client or I put you in jail or something horrible, right? But it turns out that you're my neighbor. Fine. So he's talking, and he's talking really, really quickly and sort of randomly. And he's asking for money for this thing. And he's got this little thing. He's showing it to me. And I thought it was kind of sketchy. I did. And my wife was there, and she was behind me, so it was sort of hallway, and she's on the stairs, and she could see this guy as well. But I'm right next to him, right? So this happens, and he, uh, I give him money. So I give him 20 bucks or whatever, because I just did. And mostly because I wasn't enjoying the interaction very much, and I'm kind of like, there you go. And he left, and I turned around, and my wife's like, that was sketchy. And I was like, I know, right? Like, it seems sketchy, but I, I give him the money, uh, whatever. What was the tournament? And I was like, it was this or whatever. So we go to the internet and we have a look, because this is, you know, the day and age. It's great. We look it up, and this charity tournament existed, but it had already happened. Okay? So what this guy had done was he knew this event had happened, and then he was going out, knocking on people's doors, pretending it was going to happen, and he was collecting money for it, right? Scamming people. So, I said, so Laurie, my wife, is kind of like, ah, uh, whatever. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. But I was kind of mad. Like, I was kind of mad with the guy because it was like for, like, a cancer thing or whatever. And he said, you know, he just made up all this stuff. He said he'd had cancer and he was a survivor and all this kind of stuff. And I sort of felt mad about it. I was like, ah, that's really bad. So, I decided to go and chase after him. Not because I'm like Spider-Man, right? But just because I was, like, mad. So when Laurie wanted nothing to do with it, she's like, don't do that. I'm like, you call the police. And I call him the police. Like, you call the police, I'm going to go find him. <laughs> so I get in my car, and I do find him, and he's up the street. And I say to the guy, hey, buddy, come here. I said, that was, that was bullshit. Like, that was crap. We looked it up. Oh, no, 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 no. I, yeah, it's already happened, but I'm sorry, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I say, like, no. He says, well, if you want your money back, that's fine. And I said, yeah, give me the money back. And I said, you know, and you shouldn't be doing this. Like, you're knocking on people's doors, you're, you're getting money, and it's, it's wrong. So anyway, so there is a point to this. I get back to my house, and I'm quite proud of myself at this point, right? Because I'm like a vigilante. It's, like, it's all good. So I get back to the house, and Laurie's on the phone to the police. She actually called them. And this is, like, their number one priority, as you can imagine, right? Middle of River Heights. So they're like, yeah, 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 okay, whatever. We'll send some people by, okay? And like literally 20 minutes later, 15 minutes later maybe, two police officers arrive on bicycles, right? They're like on the, the bikes. It's really cool. And I knew one of the cops. And this doesn't matter, but they, because this could go all day. But like they show up and they're like, okay, what happened? And I relay the story I've just relayed to you, okay? And they say to me, Laura and I are both standing there, so they say, wow, what'd the guy look like? And I'm like, I got this. Don't worry about this. 
said he was about five foot five. And Lori just starts laughing. It's like, that guy was like five foot 11. And I'm like, no, 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 no. He was like five foot five. Like he was like much shorter than me. He was like here. She's like, no, he was taller. <laughs> I'm like, fine, whatever, the cops are laughing, right? And I'm like, you just go over there. What was he wearing? I said, oh, this one I know. He was wearing a white shirt. Burst of laughter. The shirt was green. I'm like, it wasn't green. What are you talking about? We go through every item of clothing on this guy, every description. And our, we are totally, totally off each other, right? We don't, I'm, we're not agreeing on anything. True story. I'm standing at my front door talking to the cops. The guy walks by. He walks by. He's still doing it on the other side of the street, dressed and looking exactly as Laurie said he looked, right? <laughs> Like, I look like a fool. And the cop starts losing it because of what I do, right? The cop is losing it because he knows. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is so hard. And it had been literally 15 minutes. And, so, and I saw the guy twice. I saw him at the door, and then I saw him again, right? And I just got it wrong, like, totally. And he walked by. Incidentally, they didn't arrest him. They did after. They stopped him. And they, um, and they said, what are you doing? And he had all this money, a ton of money on him. Uh, and he had all this cash. And they were kind of like, well, I don't know if we've got grounds to, uh, they asked me if they had grounds to arrest him. Isn't that funny? I was like, I don't think I should tell you whether you should arrest the guy. Uh, and then they were like, um, but they did eventually. And he played guilty and yada, yada, yada. And I'm sorry for another day. But it just goes to show that in my own personal experience, I know how difficult it is to identify people, right? In a very short amount of time after the fact, when I had two face-to-face -face conversations very close to the guy both times, right? Seeing what he looked like. So really, really interesting. Where was I going with that? Yes, that was right. There was a reason. That's exactly what. So that was, that was where uh, that sort of came from. So we have this kind of schematic sort of inferential processing that goes on. And then we have a phenomenon within it called selective attention. Okay, so if the information that I'm receiving is relevant to a schema that I'm running in my head, then I'm going to preference that information over information that doesn't seem relevant to that schema, right? So that's what we're told now, is that in terms of how we perceive events is going to inform uh, the way that I remember it. Uh, and the best way to think about that is to think about a, or a good way to think about it, I think, is to think about two different people with two different agendas looking at the same thing. So if we have a piece of paper, one side of paper, and it's got a description of somebody on it, okay? Genevieve will use you. It's a description of you. It tells you a little bit about your life, <clears throat> a little bit about what you like to do, a bio type thing, right? Two different people from two different angles are going to look at that differently. So if a prospective employer is looking at that, they're going to be looking for, you know, what kind of experiences does she have? It's going to be relevant to this employment someone else, and they're going to prioritize that because that's their schematic that they're running, right? They're going to prioritize that information and they're going to better remember that information that they want. Someone else can look at the same information from a different perspective. A forensic psychologist, for example, might be looking at your information thinking, what is it about her that might have made her commit these crimes? What's important to me? Like, what am I looking for? So you can look at exactly the same set of information, but depending on why you're looking at that information, you're going to give it more weight, and you're going to perceive it differently, and you're going to remember it differently based on that. So that's kind of uh, interesting. The bottom line, as far as we're concerned for eyewitness identification, is the likelihood <coughs> that a witness will remember specific information will be strongly affected by the schemas. It doesn't really matter what they are, but they're going to be affected by them. Okay. There are a number of crazy studies out there that give us some real pause 
and some real cause for concern in terms of uh, witness memory. So, uh, a number of experiments have been done um, involving uh, black people in the United States and white people in terms of whether you're more likely to find a person threatening if they're black and you are white. And those are experiments that concern showing people, random white and black people, carrying something in their hand. Whether you characterize what they're having in their hand as a tool or a weapon, it's a much higher rate of weapons for black people viewed by white people, right? There's also a video game version of that experiment where people playing the video game are more likely to shoot the black people because they perceive them to be a threat even though they're not holding anything in their hand to be threatening, right? So there's, and again, this is this kind of group schematic that's running for people, right? So all of those kind of experiments are, are out there that can show that sort of uh, difference. Facial recognition is another one. So there's experiments that run where they show groups of people the same picture of someone, but much as we were talking before about priming, they're told different things about them. So a famous one out in the 1970s is when they show a picture of a man to a group of participants and they say, this man was a doctor and he ran death camps during the Holocaust. And he did these horrendous experiments, human experiments on people, just an absolute you know, atrocious human being. And then they ask people, about the look of this person afterwards. And people will say, oh my God, he's the meanest looking person I've ever seen. Like the look on his face, he just looks like evil. He looks like the kind of person that I can see exactly he'd be the person that would do this kind of thing. You can show other participants the same picture and tell them an opposite story. Tell them that this man actually saved people during the war. Right? and he ran a resistance movement, and he was a wonderful person, he saved all these people. And the, another group of participants, when they're prime, will say, and that man, his eyes are so kind. Like he just looks like a wonderful, warm, kind person. It's the same picture. It's the same picture, right? So that's worry, <laughs> because you start to see that people have to interact and ask you questions about we do as lawyers, about what you saw, right? And about what you perceived. And we have to prime you. Like we have to ask and do things. And when we get to talk about bits often, we'll talk about that. Uh, but kind of, uh, kind of crazy. So Kulikov effect, same sort of thing. So Kulikov is a filmmaker, made all these films, uh, three of them that were shown to people. Uh, and then they would show you uh, a woman, same picture afterwards. One film was about a bowl of soup, not an Oscar winner, right? One film was about a bowl of soup. The other film was about a dead woman. And the third film was about a happy little girl playing. And it would put people in a certain mood to show you the same picture afterwards. What do you think of this person? She looks sad if they watch the sad movie. She looks happy if they watch the happy movie, right? Like, the more of this stuff you read, the, the more worrying it becomes, right? It's not a can. I think it's a bowl. Yeah, yeah, she looks kind of bored, right? So those are sort of really interesting uh, things we start putting them all together. All right, so what we tell police or what the police tell witnesses about people during an investigation, we'll talk about some of the wrongful conviction in a minute, becomes hugely important once we start to understand, even at a very basic level as we're doing here, how some of that sort of psychology uh, works. There's also experiments that have shown that when we categorize people <coughs> as a particular race, and race and gender seem to be categories that we automatically have, essentially, right? So if we categorize people as a particular race, our subsequent descriptions of that person, so if we take a period of time after we've categorized them, so I'm looking at someone and they're categorized as Asian to me, that's the category I'm putting them in, and as time goes by and they do experiments when they ask people to describe the person over and over again, the descriptions become more in line with a typical category than they were to begin with. So I start to make people more Asian-like, right? 
more black, more Aboriginal, more white, whatever it is, right? Wherever I associate those features. So that, again, is something which is kind of interesting. So that's looking at influencing our memory, right? Distorting, making selective to some degree. But we can also see that in some cases, we can actually make things up. Okay, that there are experiments that have been run that show that people will actually fabricate memories based on what they're told, right? And there's a group of famous experiments uh, that ran it in the 1970s that talk about a number of different, so one second, what that is. A number of uh, different, and I don't know how ethics approval gets done for these things, I really don't, because it's dealing with children. But there are a number of experiments that have run that have said, they've checked with people's families if an event happens. For example, being bitten by a dog, right? Another one is being lost in a mall, right? And they didn't. But they've suggested to people that they did. And then people can actually create memories of something that didn't happen to them because of the information that they're being fed, right? So, <clears throat> and that's like a sort of post-offense sort of information update, is that you can actually create a false memory in people. And we used to prosecute those cases, right? Like false memory um, sexual assault cases used to be prosecuted, right? Before a lot of the work that the Elizabeth Loftus uh, did. Uh, those were fairly readily prosecuted in Canada up until about, I suppose, like 20 years ago, right? And we don't prosecute them now because some of the work that these social sciences did highlighted the fact that you can, in fact, make memory, right? You can just give it to somebody. And if you do regression therapy, so like hypnotism and stuff like that, uh, there's a very high risk of that happening. It doesn't happen in every case. You may well have that memory, but it's very, very risky to do that, right? So again, we're showing not only that we process memories in different ways, but, or uh, perceptions of events in different ways, but those memories down the road can be affected and even fabricated, right? totally made up. So again, the more of the reading you do, the, uh, the crazy it is. Familial informant false narrative procedure is what that's called, uh, where you sort of uh, tell people, yeah, your brother reminds you, remember your brother told you that time that he took you to the mall and you got lost? Oh yeah, I remember that, yeah. It didn't happen. Right? Didn't happen. So that's kind of crazy. Okay, so what I want to sort of get across here is this idea that all of these sort of crazy processes, the schematic and the sources of information that can turn your Wikipedia page, right, into someone else's Wikipedia page or a different version of your Wikipedia page, right? All of those processes are happening before people come to court, right? They're happening. There's also, and it's perception's kind of a funny area, it would seem to the reading I've done, but there's also people that have posited, neuroscientists, that have posited this idea that by telling your story, by rehearsing something, by saying something to somebody, the more you do it, the more unstable your memory becomes, right? So that you have this kind of shake effect. That if you tell a story, you're shaking all that information up, some of it's going to fall out the basket, and then other stuff's going to get put in the basket, right? So when that happens, it, the more you ask someone about something, in some ways, the less reliable it will become. Now, that's not accepted by everybody, but that's been posited. So that can be a sort of phenomenon out there that some people believe in. And that's even more scary because we make people tell a story a lot, right? You're preparing a witness, you're telling, and things that happen to witnesses, bad things that happen to people generally, as human beings, like we talk, we talk about those things. Like we, we want to talk about them, not always, right? Sometimes they're so terrible and they're so sort of hurtful to somebody that, that they won't. But very often, you know, the story I just told about, you know, the guy the 20 bucks, right? Like, I mean, I've told that story a bunch of times because it's happened and it is, you know, interesting, right? So, and every time I tell it, I'm sure there's a difference to that story, right? Every time. 
So you start to see how it becomes uh, becomes kind of uh, kind of interesting. But again, everything's sort of before we get to uh, court. So what Davis and Loftus will tell us is really simple. So while his witness memory is not only valuable but it's crucial in a case, right? It must be appreciated that even the most scrupulously honest and sincere witness cannot be presumed to be entirely accurate. Everybody is going to get it wrong, right? To some degree. Now that doesn't mean the story you tell isn't substantively true, right? So the good storytellers, right? But if you're looking for details, and we often are, <laughs> right? If you're looking for details, and you're looking for subtle distinctions and differences between the way people look, how something went down, who was holding the knife, who wasn't, whose boots were flying at the guy's head, whose weren't, right? All those things that we require, and we need detailed recollection of them, those are the things that were susceptible to all of these processes running, right? And not only they could, but they will, and they do, right? So the more we know about it, and we'll talk about, we talk about the expert testimony uh, in a little bit as to why we might need it. So that's a sort of very kind of basic overview of like how crap your memory is, right, basically, and how it can be altered. So let's think about eyewitness identification within a trial context. So what is eyewitness identification? So the process of having a witness identify a person that they have seen in an event for the court, okay? either before court, preferably, or sometimes in court, to identify somebody that's uh, associated with an event. Quite apart from the memory issues that we've just talked about, eyewitness identification evidence can be vulnerable to poor environmental factors, the stress that somebody's under, lighting, distance, poor vision, any number of factors that could make it intrinsically risky evidence, right? Forget whether someone's memory is all wrecked. When we show people a photograph, so generally speaking, this is how eyewitness identification happens, typically. Don't do a lot of lineups now, right? Still done. Don't do show ups, that's for sure, or it shouldn't. Don't do a lot of lineups. But a lot of times we do photo pack lineups, right? And because of the Sofno uh, inquiry, we have a procedure that please now have to follow because of the travesty that that, that was. We'll talk about that in a sec. But that's how typically you identify people. So please have 10 photographs, somebody, right? And they show them to you one at a time, sitting in a room. And you can see them as many times as you like. You can look at them for as long as you like. Um, but you're being asked to retrieve your memory, right? It's a memory retrieval procedure. You've seen this person. I'm looking to jog your memory and for you to tell me which person it is, right? Now, like any of those procedures, yeah. <clears throat> if you were aware of the nature of the crime, you might be subtly primed to want to identify somebody because it's a really serious crime, right? Rather than if it's a missing person. Um, what about Thomas Sofino? Take a good look at number seven. Well, yeah, that's certainly. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's literally what happened with John Dirksen. Take a good look at number seven. And then the other thing is, once you've looked at these pictures, um, that are you remembering your initial observation or are you remembering the picture? Right. And no matter how honest you are, it's pretty hard to know yourself. Right. That's exactly right. And I think, I think that's sort of one of the, the difficulties that we have all these problems with perception and processing and memory to begin with. And then you're given a pack of photographs, sometimes right after an event, not always, sometimes it's quite some time after an event, and you're asked to make a, really amounts to a guess, as to whether somebody is the person that you saw. These photo packs, by their very nature now, after Sofano, have to be very similar. The people all have to look alike, right? You can't run a photo pack. This is again, what happened to Thomas Sofano, right? You put a guy in a lineup who's eight inches taller than everyone else, you know, and then circulate a picture of him wearing a cowboy hat, when there's a front page picture in the free press with him wearing a cowboy hat, right? Like, those things you can't do, right? because it leads to wrongful convictions. You get people all believing right, that that's the person. So all of those things kind of uh, have to happen. And then you're asking people to identify someone, right? 
based on that recollection of that memory. So if we think about it within the circumstance, and we're going to go through two or three sort of examples of, of wrongful uh, convictions with uh, lineups. Uh, we think about uh, the area of wrongful conviction, presenting wrongful convictions, we look generally at a sort of constellation of these predisposing circumstances that create environments where wrongful convictions can happen. Uh, public and media pressure, always, uh, almost always a factor to some degree in wrongful convictions globally, like around the world. Like you'll find that often uh, these cases, and it's somewhat self-fulfilling because the cases that tend to come up as wrongful convictions tend to be uh, homicide cases, right? They tend to be cases where people, not all, but they tend to be cases uh, where it's a big deal. They're often very horrible homicide cases, right? Again, not always. Uh, and they garner a lot of media attention, right? Those are the kind of cases that have become sort of big. So there's always a lot of pressure, and that pressure uh, can lead to sort of noble cause corruption uh, and the idea that the police sort of uh, burrow in on someone, tunnel vision style, uh, and really start excluding everything else just to focus on one person. Media has a lot to do with that sometimes, not in every situation. Systemic discrimination has been identified as a predisposing uh, circumstances. There's always um, going to be a number uh, of problems, and we'll talk about it when we discuss uh, as we go through uh, a little bit about uh, race and wrongful convictions and, and what we're doing in Canada kind of about that and what we can sort of look to uh, in terms of uh, particularly Aboriginal people. Uh, as representation in the justice system. Our system, the system we just talked about, um, has been highlighted as being a predisposing circumstance. Any adversarial system where you are winning and losing on one side or the other uh, creates or promotes an environment uh, that can be converted into essentially a game. Right, of winning and losing, and that game uh, is, has a massive cost, or can have a massive cost if people decide they're gonna win at all costs. And again, I always have touched on this in normal cost corruption, the ends justify the means for prosecutors. Uh, very famous uh, uh, examples here in Manitoba, George Dangerfield, we have uh, a sordid history, uh, unfortunately, uh, of having people who thought they were, probably thought they were doing the right thing, uh, but managed to, uh, to focus on the ends uh, to the expense of the means. And we have uh, a trail of um, half a dozen wrongfully convicted people here in this province because of that. So all of those things are sort of, you know, environmental sort of predisposing circumstances. But we have specific and immediate causes of wrongful convictions that we know uh, all about. And depending on where you are, uh, the usual consensus within the community, both here in the United States, is that eyewitness misidentification is pretty much the number one cause, right? So of all the exonerations, DNA exonerations in the United States, and there's thousands of those now, right? So of all the DNA exonerations in the United States, in between I think 70 and 75 percent of those, some form of eyewitness misidentification was a problem, right? Might not have been the only problem, in fact often it isn't, right? It wasn't for Thomas Sofano either, right? But it's a big part of it. That includes cross-race effect. So cross-race effect, who knows what cross-race effect is? Cross-race effect is that it's been shown experimentally that you're worse at identifying people who aren't from your race, right? So, and we talked a bit about some of that earlier. But this sort of cross-race effect has been uh, studied particularly in America, right? There's a, a huge amount uh, of stuff out there now on it and it's accepted that we are worse at identifying people who don't look like us, right, basically. Um, and eyewitness misidentification sort of comes into that in a big way. Police, the ones that are asterisks are just because they're sort of specific trial uh, causes. Uh, police mishandling of investigations like inadequate disclosure, not giving people what they need to do. James Driscoll, big uh, uh, thing here with that. Unreliable scientific evidence is, again, very, very uh, high up there in terms of causing uh, wrongful convictions. Uh, somewhere in the region of bad science generally, about 50% of exonerations uh, can be linked to that. Um, unreliable expert testimony as part of this as well. Using criminals as witnesses, hugely uh, problematic, about almost 20%. 
uh, in the United States and probably more than that here actually if you look through the uh, exonerations we have. Uh, using jailhouse informants, people who are selling their story will say anything uh, to get a result. Um, bad idea. Inadequate defense work. False confessions, hugely, hugely um, important to the realm of wrongful convictions. Many, many people confess to crimes they didn't do. Counterintuitive, seems bizarre, but they do. These are people who are later exonerated scientifically, right? Uh, who've uh, pled guilty uh, and confessed falsely. Uh, and then misleading circumstantial evidence and narrative. So we have all of these kind of uh, causes that go to uh, show us that there's any number of areas that we need to be concerned about. But again, the literature reflects the number one area is this. And hopefully we can see why, right? You can see why that's the number one area, because there are so many potential problems with that, with your memory uh, and your uh, eyewitness misidentification. So let's look sort of uh, relatively quickly at a number of, and we'll just sort of go over uh, Cole's notes, on uh, Sofano, Hanemeyer, uh, Leighton Hay, and then talk a little bit about uh, the work that Innocence Canada is doing, and, and we'll sort of look at that. So. Uh, Thomas Sofano was, uh, was living in Vancouver at the time, but, it, but it, the wrongful conviction uh, happened here. Uh, very, very famous story. Uh, everyone I'm sure in the room will know about Barb Stroppel was a 16-year-old waitress at a donut shop that's now a subway over on Marion there, um, just over the bridge. And um, a tall gentleman with a, wearing a cowboy hat walked in there. He was seen walking in there at 20 after 8 at night. Uh, he turned around and he locked the door as he walked in. He's seen talking to this young girl, though she was there on her own. And uh, then he's seen following her towards the washroom. And people witness that someone's waiting for his wife to come out of another store and sees this happening. So uh, people think it's somewhat odd. And about 20 minutes later, the guy comes out. So he comes out uh, and someone's there and says, what are you doing? And the guy says, oh, it's closed. And he flips the clothes sign over and he walks off, right? Another person walks in there and finds Barbara Stoppel laying on, on the ground, right? So, and she's not dead at that point, she dies uh, later. But uh, really, really horrible, horrible, horrible thing. And one guy, a guy called John Dirksen, he chases after uh, him. He grabs a baseball bat at the Domo and he chases after him. And he gets to him on the bridge, um, and the man, the guy who's killed Barso, pulls out a knife on him. And he's like, okay, well, I don't want any part of this, uh, and gives up the chase, like wisely so, it would seem, right? Uh, and then this guy, this guy leaves. So Thomas Sofino had just come into town from Vancouver, and he was there uh, in Winnipeg to try and see his daughter. Um, been part of a divorce and was uh, seen as a young kid. And he wasn't at the donut shop, we know that now. He was across town uh, getting his car fixed, uh, buying some stuff to give to the hospital, and all kinds of things were going on. But he wasn't there, right? But unfortunately for him, uh, he, was, uh, he was thought to be. So Thomas Sofano ended up being uh, arrested. He actually didn't look really like the person who, they actually think they know who killed Bird Sopper now he's dead, uh, the guy who, who uh, uh, they think actually did it. Um, but what happened for uh, Thomas was one of the witnesses said as he ran across the bridge, he was seen to throw something away and they went and they found that and it was a piece of twine and there's a big uh, scientific portion of this too because that wasn't properly tested. They ended up thinking it was twine that was used in the state of Washington that you could buy easily in Vancouver. And of course he lived in Vancouver, so he's a murderer. So they put all that together. But they had four different eyewitnesses identifying. John Dirksen's a guy that um, sort of chased after him. And he's the guy who was told by the police officers, like, take a look at number seven. Like, yeah, so you're gonna wanna focus on, right? Uh, stuff like that. He couldn't identify uh, Sofno in a lineup, and then the bizarrest thing happened. He ends up, he's like paying a parking ticket or something, he ends up at the uh, public safety building, and the front page of the paper was running the um, 
artist rendition, like he was running the, the image that they come up with of this guy. And he decides to ask the people at the public safety board, hey, is Thomas Sofnell here who got arrested? Can I go have a look at him? Because I've got my picture now. And he sort of went in and they let him <laughs> go and have a look at the guy, right? And then he's like, oh yeah, no, I think that's him. I think that's him then, right? I know it's laughable, right? I mean, if it wasn't so serious, right? But it's like, it's terrible. But that's the kind of stuff that was going on, right? Like, identity is tainted, like you wouldn't believe. And we had all this, and Thomas Sofano had what? He had three trials, right? He had two trips to the Court of Appeal. Took forever to eventually get acquitted in the Court of Appeal. He was convicted twice, spent three and a half years, almost four years in jail. Um, and he wasn't there. He couldn't have been there. Now, there's all kinds of other problems with that case as well, in terms of the scientific evidence, in terms of the police corruption uh, of trying to fabricate. When they found out he was across town at the Canadian Tire, they decided to sort of try and map his route, and like they came up with this bizarre sort of, you know, if he was like a Formula One driver, like maybe he could have got there in time to kill her kind of thing, right? And it's just like, it's you no know, because corruption is tunnel vision, it's just like a masterclass in it, right? It's horrible. But a big part of it was the fact that people believed it was him because his image was everywhere, it went in the papers, the sort of media pressure, and they, they start picking him out. So really, really kind of crazy. Does anyone know who Anthony Hanemeyer is? Anthony Hanemeyer is um, a guy out of uh, Toronto, near Toronto, who in 1987, I think, I'm guessing, around then, uh, was uh, working on a construction uh, site in an area, I think, of uh, Scarborough and Newmarket, one of these places. I don't really know those places, but they're near Toronto. A man broke in to a young woman's bedroom. Uh, she was 16 years old or 15 years old, I think. Broke into her bedroom uh, and with a knife uh, got on top of her and made noise, thankfully, and her mum woke up. And her mum came through and surprised this person there, who luckily got up and ran out, right? And mum got a look at the person. Said he had small ears and a baby face, blonde hair. <clears throat> and um, after this happened, obviously very, very shaken up and, and what have you, uh, but the girl wasn't hurt. After this happened, Mum decided that she was going to be proactive and she talked to the police and whatever, they didn't have a suspect. So she decided, she's seen the guy, right? She decided to go around some local businesses, construction sites, and she shows her description of this person to a construction store manager who says, that looks like Anthony Hanemeyer. Looks like Anthony Hanemeyer, who incidentally had just quit his job there a couple of days earlier. Uh, looks like him. So she goes and shares this information with the police. Uh, the person was seen to get into a white car and take off. Anthony Hanemeyer didn't have a white car, he had a black car. Uh, he never drove his car over there anyway. Uh, he wasn't in the vicinity at the time. And this is where the story just gets like bizarre. Mum was so sure it was him. She was so positive that she could identify him that uh, it went to trial. Anthony Hanemeyer was offered a number of deals and he wouldn't take any of them because he didn't do it. And he said, I didn't do it. And they said, well, you're going to get 10 years for this, right? Like the attempted rape and assault of a, of a young girl, like you're going you're gonna to do a lot of time. And he kept saying, what can I tell you? Like, I, I didn't do it. Mum testifies and she's brilliant. Like, she is so sure this is the guy. His, he's imprinted on her brain. Like, she knows this is him. She's certain it's him. So she testifies, and Anthony's lawyer says, you're in trouble, right? You're going to get convicted. Like, this woman is, she, she knows it's you, right? She's identified you. He still won't take a deal. The Crown's now offering him two years off a of 10, right? So a two-year deal. He says no. Thinks about it overnight, second day of trial comes, it gets worse, and he decides to take the deal. See, so he pleads guilty. He pleads guilty to something he didn't do. As if the story can't get any crazier for Anthony. So eyewitness all over, right? This is a whole case against him, his mum, right? He ends up pleading guilty. Years later, a guy called Rob Balchevich is another uh, exonerated guy. Wrong, the Innocence Canada people are working on his file, and they're reviewing files from the late 80s, and they find out 
that someone else had confessed to breaking into that house, right? At that time. Um, randomly, they find this on a file. Like, they just find it there, right? So they're reviewing another file, and they find this out. Anthony Hanemar has come, he's been and done, he's done his 18 months, he's out, right? He's been out for years, and they find it. And it turns out to be, um, what's his name? Carla Homolka and, yeah, Paul Bernardo. Scarborough Rapist, he was called at the time. So it was Paul Bernardo, and who also fit the description. So they found out that it was Paul Bernardo, but that was completely by chance, right? After this guy had already done 18 months training. And this woman was completely married to being, being Anthony Hanemar, to the point where he pled guilty. Isn't that crazy? That, that that evidence was so wrong and yet so powerful that halfway through a trial, a guy's like, yeah, I, I might as well. I'm not going to win this, right? She convinced me it was me, right? Anyway, so again, very, very dangerous evidence, eyewitness evidence. Leighton Hay, uh, Leighton Hay's a young man uh, uh, from uh, Toronto. That was a uh, attempt to murder and murder at a nightclub. Uh, it's a more recent one. Leighton did a lot of time in jail, uh, 12 years. A uh, man with a lot of uh, uh, personal issues and, and mental health issues. Uh, Leighton was identified as somebody who was involved in, a, uh, in this homicide. Another guy who was identified lived with them. Police went to pick them both up and a description of Leighton was given uh, and someone said he was the second shooter and someone said the second shooter has these little dreadlocks on his, on his head. And unfortunately for the police, when they picked Leighton up, he didn't have any. And they were like, this is inconvenient. So they, they go back and say, okay, well, um, maybe he shaved his head. So they look for uh, evidence of that and they find like a, like a, a hair clipper uh, thing and it's got hairs all over it and they're like, oh, perfect, great. He went back and he had to disguise himself, so he shaved his head. And Leighton says, I shaved my head like two years ago, like, what are you talking about? And they're like, oh, don't worry about that. Someone identified Leighton, they couldn't identify him very well. In fact, the first time they looked at him, they're like, I, I don't, really just don't know. Second time they said, well, I'm sort of 80% sure that it's him, right? And that was enough of an identification, eyewitness identification, even without the dreadlocks with this crazy theory to get him done. Leighton goes to jail on a first degree because it was a, a sort of fight they'd gone back with guns to kill these people that pissed them off and all this kind of stuff. And it was really, really crazy. It turns out, in fact, uh, after instance kind of gets involved, it turns out that the, uh, the hairs that they built their case on were actually hairs from uh, your body, not hairs from your head, uh, but they'd never had them tested at the time. Uh, and actually, the latent story was true, he'd been home all night, right? So like, those are, those are uh, examples where eyewitness testimony has put people away or been a big part of putting people away, right? Uh, in Anthony Hanemar's case, it was the only thing, really, that, that was putting them away. Uh, and people have either been scientifically exonerated or certainly uh, acquitted at the appeal court level, Supreme Court of Canada level, based on the fact that we no longer think that it was possible for them to have done these crimes, right? And they were all identified uh, as such. So that just kind of like contextualizes it a little bit. Just wanted to talk, um, if it's okay to keep going. How long have I been talking for? Too long, I know. Like an hour maybe? Can I keep going for a little while? Is that cool? Um, about sort of, uh, sort of race and exoneration and Innocence Canada. Um, and this isn't about, uh, there's no judgment in Innocence Canada here. Innocence Canada is absolutely terrific work. But if you look at the people who are exonerees, right, <coughs> uh, of that organization, like the majority of those people uh, are not racialized people, right? The majority of those people certainly aren't Aboriginal, Indigenous uh, people. They tend to be white people. Uh, and black people, actually a couple, uh, one East Indian person. Uh, but when we think about the overrepresentation uh, of indigenous people in uh, our justice system, we use that euphemism all the time, right? Overrepresentation. So around 30% of entry into, into the uh, correction system, 3% of the population. We do not have that exoneration rate that's mirrored uh, at Innocence, okay, or any, any of the Innocence organizations in the, in the country, including our own. Like, we don't have that, that rate kind of mirrored. So, 
I'm interested in, in why, why that is, right? Like, I mean, uh, there's any number of reasons why, uh, but I'm generally sort of interested in why, because people tend to, I think, um, feel that if, or I certainly feel, that if we have that many more uh, or high percentage of indigenous people involved in the system, they should represent an equally high percentage of the people who are being exonerated, whose cases are being, are being looked at. And they don't. That's an observation. It's nothing more. But they don't. So that's kind of interesting. Now, there are some. Uh, like Bill Mullins Johnson was uh, exonerated by Ensis Canada, albeit as part of the, the Charlie Smith stuff. Um, but he was, um, he was an exoneree. He was a First Nations guy. Uh, but generally speaking, there isn't. So I bring that up, not again, not to, to point fingers at people, but just as an observation. It's interesting that we have this over attention, but it's not being shown uh, on the exoneration side in terms of files being followed up. And it's certainly not because Indigenous people aren't claiming to have been wrongfully convicted, because they do, right? Of course they do. Lots of people are claiming that. Lots of people out there claiming that who aren't, right? And lots of people claiming that who are, right? And that's the sort of work we're doing here uh, in the clinic. So that's just to sort of uh, think about that globally, sort of put that in your head as to, to why that, that might be. I think what's really sort of important or interesting is this sort of confluence or where these two worrying things intersect. Uh, people pleading guilty, because there's a very high rate of people actually plead guilty, uh, despite the fact that they're innocent, uh, and eyewitness identification. So how many people who are accused of trials plead guilty when they're faced with an on-paper one with identification, something similar to Anthony Hanemeyer's, you're going to be convicted. You know, how many people aren't taking that to trial? They're just pleading because they're always advising them to plead. Uh, and is that, can we get at that information? Can we file review that? Is there a quantitative, so number version? Can we do a qualitative analysis of that? Are defense lawyers, do they have files that are advising people to plead guilty based on this evidence that we know to be incredibly frail evidence, right? Uh, and if so, do we actually have a much higher number of people who are going to go down, not necessarily in homicides, right, but are going to go down, because um, those tend to be litigated. Like, generally speaking, they'll tend to go in, right? Not always, but generally they do. Uh, and then what is the relationship with, between variables, like, how many uh, indigenous people are there, how many women, how many men, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's an area that I think need, needs people to look at, right? There needs to be uh, people sort of looking at that confluence, and we're starting to kind of look into that uh, area. Uh, but interesting sort of, uh, sort of research uh, questions. Just want to sort of finish off with this idea of uh, sort of contextualizing what I've said about how bad this evidence can be, certainly and how powerful it is in the courtroom. He's the guy, right? Like, it's very, very powerful evidence. So very quick story before we talk about this. I prosecuted a guy for, um, to, like, a aggravated assault. He beat someone uh, to bits with a baseball bat. And uh, <clears throat> had a witness go up in the stand. So I'm the prosecutor. Had a, wit had a witness go up in the stand. And uh, she was at the party that night. Uh, so I want her up there. And she gets up there, and before she's got her bum on the seat, so she literally gets up, and she's just about to sit down, and she's going, it definitely wasn't that guy, <laughs> and points to the accused. And I'm like, okay, we'll get there, we'll get there. The judge starts laughing. Like, just actually, like, bursts out laughing. And I would have, too. Like, it was hilarious. Yeah, he just, like, bursts out laughing. I'm like, it's fine. I argued that case all the way that lost, clearly. Um, all the way to the end even still. Uh, so that kind of stuff happens, right? It happens all the time you know, in these files. Well, not that, but similar things. But if eyewitness memory is so fallible, why do we allow it? Like, why are we allowing this sort of idea of identity? Well, we need to know who people are. It's an essential element of a case, right? We need to know someone's identity. But if we're seeing it's such a fallible thing, why are we allowing it in court? And if we are allowing it, shouldn't we be having some kind of expert opinion evidence that's explaining to people why it's so difficult and so bad, potentially, in any given situation? And would special instructions to juries suffice to reduce wrongful convictions based on eyewitness identification? So this is a global look at, are we doing enough? What happens right now, typically, 
is that a judge will warn a trier of fact, either themselves or a jury, will warn them these can be risky, right? There's a massive body of literature out there that says your memory's not very good and your eyewitness identification capacities aren't very good and if you're identified someone particularly for another race, that's really difficult, right? Stuff like that. Uh, and they'll do it. So a case goes up Woodard in 2009, which was a beating death. A uh, guy walked past the balcony, there's a party on, three guys go down, they exchange words or whatever, and three people beat, beat somebody to death. Uh, and one of, there's a group of witnesses who don't know the people at the party, so eyewitness ID becomes an issue. And that goes up all the way up to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal says, oh, so the issue was what happened at trial, defense warrants put an eyewitness um, ID expert in there to say, uh, you shouldn't be accepting this evidence because it's, it's no good, right? It's very, very frail. And Court of Appeal says no. So they say no, no, no. Um, that's within the trial judge's discretion and the trial judge, and it's essentially superfluous. So it doesn't meet like the Mohan expert evidence criteria because you don't need it because you can just tell a jury that eyewitness identification is bad, right? Uh, so that issue sort of died uh, there but then came up again uh, Mohammed that just came in, that was a, a stabbing death that happened on uh, Osborne Bridge there. Um, again, sort of a, a very kind of random event, a tragedy. Uh, and again, uh, eyewitness identification issue comes up and they want to uh, get an expert in place to talk about this. And Court of Appeal again says, no, well, you can have a voir dire in it, but that evidence doesn't have to be accepted. And we're not going to allow that. So we're dealing with this very, very difficult evidence, very tricky area that we're saying we're not allowing somebody with real expertise in the area, so a psychologist, somebody that does this kind of work, who conducts these experiments, right, a researcher, to come forward and say, not just in a global sense of we've done, but specifically, right, why these things uh, can't be done. So I don't know what people think about that. I don't know if, I mean, there's, there's definitely a, a legal reason not to do it, as the Court of Appeal has found, that it's within a trial judge's discretion. But trial judges don't seem to want, generally, to have expert evidence about this, uh, preferring just to tell a jury, well, it's dodgy, right? Be careful with it. But in my view, you're not really accepting the fact of how powerful the evidence is. Like an Anthony Hanamara sort of situation, like mum is going to come forward and say, like, I know that's the person. The same way that I might have done with the guy at my door, and I would have been so wrong, like so wrong. But I was sure that, I wasn't lying to the police, like I was sure that's what he looked like. I was sure he was that tall, I was sure he was wearing a white shirt. And he wasn't, right? So I don't know, and I wasn't trying to be wrong. Hmm? Could it change? That's possible. I, you know what, Cole? I, I'm, exactly. I, you can tell her that. I, I, I won't, but, uh, but you know, I hope that's the case, but I suspect it isn't. I suspect that I was wrong, you know, and it just sort of shows, and again, it's borne out by, by what we see. So I just wanted to sort of throw that out there and see if people had, have views on that, if you, you agree with that or disagree with that or, or none of the above, right? But I just thought it was kind of interesting. Is it that they don't want to have expert witness testimony on it, or the fact that they already put this so bogged down? It just adds to the lot of delay and slows an already sluggish kind of criminal justice system. Yeah, although I suppose, I mean, it, it hasn't been argued that much, right? So, I mean, you've got quite a, a ways between these, and I don't know how many times it was argued in the meantime in other provinces too. I, I don't know that information. Uh, but I don't think uh, it's coming up all the time. Um, but the fact that it has, you already have to have a voir dire. You've got to put that evidence in. You've got to let the judge hear it anyway, right? So, I mean, it's, you know... I guess, the, I guess the Court of Appeal, by stomping on it, can say, well, stop doing it, right? Like, you just waste time. So that's a perspective for sure. That might be the case. Uh, does it just pervade too much on the function of the trier of fact, right? Again, we, le we have this legal fiction, right, that we can tell that people are, are great at, at everything, right? Uh, telling if people are lying and, you know, the way they look down at their shoes and all the rest of it, right? Um, if that's the case, maybe it is just simply going to be about the jury's going to be better at doing that. They're going to, if they believe somebody, right, if they can look in their eye and they can believe that they, they're the, they saw the guy in her daughter's bedroom, right? But people can be wrong. The States is replete with those cases. Like, people are wrong. They, even after the fact, one of the witnesses in Sofano, I think, was like this as well. Even after the fact, they still believe it was him. Even when you're showing people, like, DNA exoneration, like, it was someone else that did that, right? 
even when other people confess it, you've got eyewitnesses who will still say, I'm, I wasn't wrong. Like that was, I know he did that, right? The terrible thing, if you read some of Bruce McFarlane's work as well, one of his articles that talk about uh, the, uh, the Crown's office, like you have, you've got police and Crown prosecutors who will say that too after the fact, right? When people are exonerated, they still believe they had the right person. Right, it's scary, go ahead. I think it would be valuable to have an expert opinion come in when it's uh, a serious allegation. <coughs> but if it were something, maybe if it was just like they stole something, maybe not so much. But when the stakes are quite high and it's somebody's, you know, liberty at stake, I think it's more important to have something like that. Because as a jury member, you might not have had the education to know that people sometimes aren't always right in what they think. Right. Right, that's exactly right. And that's what the test is about, right? Like, it's about that. It says, you know, I'll come to you just a sec. It says that, you know, is it necessary? Is it beyond the ken or the knowledge of the, of the trier of fact? Like, if you don't, if you know about it, then yeah, you don't need it. You don't need expert evidence, right? And that's really what the Court of Appeal is saying as well. Yeah, but everyone knows this evidence is ropey. Why are we using it, right? Like, is one thing you could ask. But even if you don't, it's, you know, it's interesting, like the way that the, the, uh, the opinions are coming down to basically say, we've got this covered, right? Like, I mean, we'll just tell people it's bad evidence. Sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, yeah, even with the expert, you know, testimony and the uh, special instructions of the jury, if the mother is saying, I know this guy was in my house raping my dog. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty, she's 100% certain, so I'm gonna go with that. So I'm wondering if- It's, it's hard not to, I think, right? Like, I think it'd be hard for me as a jury member too, like, She's positive, right? And you're like, well, you heard it, right? I mean, she's sure. Isn't the problem, people will hear this and they'll understand, they always think that applies to other people, their memory's bad, but I think- Exactly, exactly. And that's what even this sort of basic overview of the area shows you, right? Is that it's everybody, right? It's everyone is subject to this, right? Everyone's gonna have a foul, of course we do. Everyone's got a fallible memory. Uh, and that's sort of the whole, the whole issue. But I can also understand why the courts are saying, well, and not just for expedience, but I understand why the courts are saying, well, look, you know, as long as, we, are they actually adding anything to this, right? Like just fleshing out how bad it is. If I tell them it's really bad and you've got to be careful with it, are you adding anything to it, right? Uh, within the specific confines, because the cases that have gone up as well are usually talking about it generically, right? So not necessarily in this particular situation. If a case comes up where you've got a witness that can come forward to talk specifically about the facts of that case and say, okay, in this situation, the reason I think it's infallible, but you rub up against all these other problems in the law of evidence and that you're not supposed to give that kind of ultimate issue, right? You're supposed to allow the trier of fact to make that determination, right? So it's interesting. Yeah, I was just gonna say, like, uh, you had mentioned uh, George Dangerfield. Yeah. Like, suppressing of evidence or if there's, like, some conflicts, so so greater transparency and, you know, the, they need to dispose the evidence properly to the defense so they right. can raise these issues. Right, exactly. And, th and, that's, and I think in these, these cases that, that's what they're doing. But you're also sort of up against the same thing anyone else is, right? Like at the end of the day, if someone's going to come in and say that's the guy, well, you know, it's, pow it's powerful evidence, right? And I think you had said the article that, that John wrote. Like it, it's, it's really powerful to hear that from people. Is it perhaps just worth knowing that it's not fixed already? You know, that, you know there are certain things in valuable about the human condition that just can't really change. And we probably can't develop a system that's more sophisticated than you know, as it is now. And just have to sift through the wrongful convictions when they do happen. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, unfortunately, I mean, that seems to be where we are, right? Like, I mean, we've had so many of these uh, wrongful conviction, even in Canada, like so many of these royal commissions, so many of the inquests and inquiries that all say the same thing over and over again, right? All those things that we highlighted in terms of predisposing circumstances and specific causes, those come up in them all, right? Tunnel visions in like literally every one, right? <laughs> you know, eyewitness ID at some points in a bunch of them, right? Now I've highlighted three here, but it's in more, you know, so all of these things do keep coming up, right? Yeah. I was gonna say like in terms of like full speed, in terms of what are our alternatives? Right. If we don't, like the very first question there, why allow the court at all? Well, what alternatives do we have aside from putting cameras across every inch of the entire world? Right. Or at least certain incentives, which raises issues of privacy. Yeah. Well, we already do a pretty good job of that, right? There's cameras pretty much everywhere, right? Yeah. 
and in other countries, like way more even than here, right? Um, yeah, you know, in the UK, it's crazy how many uh, how many uh, CCTVs are. And, and maybe that that helps, I suppose, having more cameras does help to, even if not to remove the need for eyewitness testimony to reinforce what it is accurate. Right. Yeah, yeah, like supporting evidence, right? Um, corroborate. If one change the system, what would you do? Has to be one with no fudging. I don't know. That's a really good question. I don't know. I have to think about where it is. It's a, I know why it's from you. Of course, it's a good question. Uh, it wouldn't be this. I can tell you that, right? Like, because I, I, I'm, I'm somewhat inclined to agree that I think if you were to, uh, there is no way really to not allow it, right? It's powerful evidence, and and don't forget, it can be completely accurate, right? It can be. It's not that it, it has to be wrong. It's that it's subject to these frailties, right? It can be wrong. It has shown to be wrong, right? But it doesn't mean it's wrong in every case. It doesn't mean that, that you're never going to be able to, to get a proper identification. You always got to remember that, right? Like, it's, that's, not, that's not what the science says. Like, it's not always going to be wrong. If it was always going to be wrong, then you wouldn't have it, presumably, right? But it's going to be very sort of powerful. And crimes often happen with people who know each other, right? So it doesn't matter anyway. Right? Like you're not really looking at eyewitness identification. If you know someone, you know them, right? Um, you're not necessarily going to be trying to identify them. Now. These are ones where it's involving strangers, people on the street. You see something happening and they run off the Thomas Sofino type thing, right? You don't know who that guy is. You have no idea, right? So that's the situation. So it's not every case that it's going to come up in. So we can't say that, you know, uh, it's going to be in every case, but in those cases, you've got to prove it's someone, they've got to prove identity, like it's an essential element of the file, right? You've got to prove it. So how else are you going to do it if you don't have people come into court to say, yeah, that's the guy, right? So I'm pretty sure that's the guy. That's not, again, unless it's caught on camera, right? Yeah. So I can't fix that. I wish I could. That'd be good. Anything else? Anyone else? Questions? Well, I Lisa? To follow up on your, yes. on your musing about why we don't see the same number statistically of cases in innocent yeah. products that are, yeah, that's really, yeah. that are picking I'd, I'd up like indigenous people. Yeah. So I don't know how those projects select cases. Yeah. So I would be wondering are they promoted <coughs> from without? Like, do community members promote a case, in which case? communities that are more politicized or into advocacy and and have more um, belief in the system yeah. might be those that are directing the review of cases. I don't know how that works. Right. And the other point would be if it was a random, you know, we're going to go through these cases, we're going to give a law student a stack of 100 cases yeah. and ask them to look through them. Then, for flags or whatever. Then the then again without taking away things like names and pictures, yeah. you would have the same racialized biases yeah. of the law students perpetrated on the file. Yeah. So uh, there's a there's a lot of reasons why certain groups of cases might come to the top. Yeah. No, I think that's right. And, and just to be completely clear, I'm not accusing Ensign's kind of being racist. Um, I, can tell you, I, I can tell you how we do it, right? Like, so most, and these groups are all, so ours is the, what we do here is probably the, the most recent sort of incarnation of, of an Ensign's project in, in Canada. Uh, what the groups tend to do is everyone's sort of connected, right? So um, like Tamara Levy's outfit at UBC, um, as Innocence Canada, the other one that's still kind of running at York, I think, uh, and then there's one that was getting off the ground in Alberta. I'm not really sure what they're doing with that. So those are all the sort of uh, projects, and there's a lot of like inter-project referrals. So like, we'll take referrals from other people, usually geographically. So everyone we're dealing with uh, just now, we have like four or five, six people, I guess, we're dealing with. Everyone but one uh, is a First Nations person. That's just the way the files have come in. But they're also files from uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, right? Uh, where there's a higher proportion uh, of uh, indigenous people. So like that's just the way, that's not a mandate of the clinic, that's just the way that, it, that it's happened. Um, I know that most of our clients have been either out to UBC and been referred to us, or they've gone, some people have been around for a little while, right? 
uh, kicking around between various innocence projects that have been reviewed somewhere else, maybe they come to us, or they might come to us and go somewhere else, or, or whatever. So there's a lot of that kind of exchange of stuff. Our mandate's quite geographic. Like, we only really want to deal with people from Manitoba and Saskatchewan because it's just easier to do that. Um, and often the other projects don't necessarily want to deal with that work, right? So it's, it's good for us. We need to fulfill our mandate, right? So, so we sort of get stuff from everywhere. There's a lot of people who um, will be referred by different outside agencies within or collateral agencies within the justice system. So people who are working, like chaplains and you know this kind of stuff, will refer people in. Uh, there's also uh, a number of sort of connections that Essence Canada has because it's the main gig, right? So that's the main sort of player in, in Canada. So they're very connected to Innocence Network, for example, in the States, uh, and they're very connected to the sort of community at large. So they'll get uh, referrals based on, on that. Um, and then just word of mouth, right? For people saying, well, I'm working with so-and-so and, you know, whatever. So, yeah, but I think you're right. I, I don't know if there's a way that you can sort of eradicate that. And again, I'm not accusing people of that. I'm just simply saying that it would be nice. Like, I certainly can't envisage a world based on what we know now. I can't envisage a world where less indigenous people are being wrongfully convicted. <laughs> like, I, I can't, it just is, that isn't the case, I'm sure. And, and it's quite possible it's higher, right? I mean, I certainly wouldn't be out on a limb saying that, I don't think. So because of that, um, that's why it concerns me, because there should be more work being done on that, right? Um, and I haven't talked to James. I don't know why, why it's come the way it has. Again, they're not picking these files generally. Like, they're, people are coming in and they have to, if you get wrongfully convicted and you want to sit and do your time and not tell anybody, you can't, you're never going to know about these files, right? That's just the reality of the situation. Also, and this is getting maybe off into the weeds a little bit, but I also know that we have a number of clients and people that I've been dealing with over the years, uh, particularly First Nations people who have very tragic stories, uh, who have absolutely no trust in the system whatsoever, and I'm part of the system, right? And so is Innocence Canada, like whether they, they want to be or not. So they have no real trust in that, and I deal with that even with clients we have just now, um, where it's very difficult to establish that trust, and I don't, I get why, I totally get why. So that might be part of it too, whereas, um, seeing more white faces on the Innocence Canada website, is it because those people are coming forward? Are, you know, frankly, Euro-Canadian white people still doing better in the system, even post-conviction, right? It looks like they are, in my view. But again, that's not accusing anyone of anything. That's just simply saying, that's just showing that sort of degree of, of privilege, perhaps, where people feel they can access that justice, right? You know? Just, uh, Sorry. No, no, um, yeah. <clears throat> I'll come back to you. Uh, Dave, just a, a few quick observations we'll talk about those soon. Uh, first of all, thank you, David. You're very welcome. welcome. appreciate that. Yeah, no problem at all. Uh, a couple of other things. Uh, David here has been talking about did it or didn't do it. Simple factual evaluation. And people have been completely, sincerely convinced and utterly wrong about that. Now think about the other things that we determine in the system. Not just did it, did it do it there, not there. Uh, did I do that with intent to cause death? Did I do that with intent to cause grievous bodily harm? You can be wrong about did it or didn't do it. Just think about when you're evaluating mental states, how easily you can be mistaken. And then we also do evaluation had reasonable and probable grounds, had reasonable grounds to believe they were threatened. Well, if we can be wrong about the most elementary thing about was there, wasn't there, just think how many more biases, expectations, interpretations get involved when we're evaluating mental states, intent, purpose, and so on, or when we're making a normative evaluation. This was reasonable, this was unreasonable, this was just, this was unjust. In terms of coping with that, there's um, one participant here asked, well, can you name one thing? I, I, I'd say a lot of things. <laughs> it's a challenge in risk management. It's not, you don't deal with wrongful convictions just by telling people, let's be honest out there, any more than you deal with car accidents by telling everybody to drive carefully. You should train drivers, and you should instruct people to drive carefully, but there's other stuff you do. You know, those uh, driver tests, uh, periodic testing with people who uh, had a high record of having accidents, 
Then even except if everybody does right things go wrong, so you have seat belts and stuff. And you might eventually well become pretty skeptical of your ability to decide who's negligent or not in an accident. And we actually have no fault insurance now, right? We really don't even try anymore to make evaluations, which are rather difficult. We have no fault divorce, right? It's so difficult to entangle the narrative that we give up altogether. When you talk about countries that the United States still have the death penalty, people tend to think of it in terms of did it or didn't do it. I would guess there's actually at least many more mistakes done about more subtle stuff. Yeah, did it, but did it with, with intent to kill? Um, was that somebody overreacting to a threat, or was that somebody you know, <coughs> with the intent to shoot a police officer? Was it, what, what was the state of mind there? You can't be as precise about that as you can about a simple factual one. And the possibility of people wrongly interpreting events and so on and so forth seems to be higher than those cases. Which is one reason not to have the death penalty. It's not and just did, didn't do it or didn't do it, but what was the state of mind you had to do it? And probably more mistakes about that or mistakes about mitigating factors. Did this person's conduct impair by the fact that they had FASD or they were an abused child and so on and so forth? It's not just, you, you read the wrongful conviction cases in the death penalty and you know, think did it or didn't do it as a focus. But I wonder how many cases are wrong about not perceiving that a person, for example, mitigating factor was some sort of neural damage or some sort of childhood trauma or something like that. That's the difference between death and not death. Not guilty or not guilty, but death penalty and life in prison. I would guess, I don't know for sure, how could we know for sure, but there's an awful lot of susceptibility for error. Uh, next point I uh, would make is influence of culture. So as you can tell from my opening remarks and the other stuff Dave's talking about, I am of the view that a lot of this stuff is it's essentially human nature, that is not culturally specific. Everybody everywhere, for example, is susceptible to the same things and remember them in light of an interpreter mechanism. I see what I expect to see, I remember what I expect to remember, I expect what I want to remember, I remember what people expect to remember. There are, however, cultural influences. So, um, I read one report from Australia which said, there's indigenous people being wrongly convicted there because in some indigenous cultures, it's considered wrong to directly contradict somebody. You get along with people, which makes sense. In a lot of indigenous cultures, you've got to live with everybody on one basis your entire life. So a lot of things there, restorative justice, non-intervention, and so on, are about cultures where you constantly have to be in the same community. Uh, and you want to be pretty careful about getting into confrontation and antagonism. Well, that's a culture factor you might want to be aware of when you're dealing with cases involving people from that particular culture. You don't want to stereotype, you don't want to overestimate. But it's something. And culture is not just gross or motor culture that is <coughs> this ethnicity or that ethnicity. There's other cultures, right? There could be a gang culture. Maybe there's gang culture about when you when you can rat out somebody when you can't. You can rat out somebody from another gang, but not somebody from your own gang. Or somebody from your brother and your cousin never, but maybe maybe somebody who has finished their gang membership. I don't know. There's police cultures, right? One police culture might be my fellow officer is accused of offense. This is an offense to me because I'm an upright police officer, so of course I will, I will testify against them. Another police culture would be, hey, we all can make a mistake under pressure, so I'm going to do everything possible not to remember or not to report or not to indict a fellow officer. So these cultural factors are significant. You don't want to overstate them, you don't want to understate them. Even in the immediate transactional criminal case, just as they're going to be when we talk about all history, just as they're going to be. Uh, I go just go back again about not going about not stereotyping. You know, it's never as simple as some of the articles make it up to be. Western culture, so-called Western culture. There's no such thing as Western culture. There's a whole lot of Western cultures. There's a whole lot of different indigenous cultures. And just because somebody belongs to a culture doesn't mean that they necessarily fall into a certain pattern. But it's just one of the dimensions of the things we want to look at as we go through this. Is being alert to the fact that there could be cultural influences in all these respects. It's just one of the things that feeds into the expectations that affect the way we perceive in the first place, the way we remember the uh, Anything you wanted to add before we wrap up? Uh, just really quick, you just picking up, Brian, on a point you made there about sort of a uh, uh, community. Like that's certainly been sort of my experience in terms of uh, prosecuting and defending people from, from small communities, particularly First Nation communities. 
um, uh, in the north and what have you, is that it's a very different sort of dynamic in terms of uh, both geographic isolation and uh, community focus and feel. So people are, and when you talk about the criminal justice system there as opposed to in Winnipeg where often people aren't going to know who each other are and stuff like that, when you're working in those environments it can be quite uh, stark, I suppose, uh, that you see the effects on people's lives. And I always like to uh, tell people that, you know, I, I had my eyes, eyes which weren't closed, I can tell you, uh, well and truly opened. Uh, working in um, uh, up north where you go into small communities, uh, particularly prosecuting those communities, when you're asking people to testify against each other and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and I've been challenged by people, and crowns are every day in these communities, and rightly so, by people saying, well, it's fine for you because you can ask me to get up and testify against my old man for beating me up. And he did beat me up, right? That's what happened. Uh, I'm not lying about it, but the bruises to show and it happened, but I'm not going to get up and I'm not going to testify. And the reason I'm not going to testify is because two hours from now, you're going to get on a plane and you're going to leave. And I'm going to be here, he's going to be here, his family's going to be here, uh, our kids are still going to be here, right? Everything is going to go on. And that's really, really difficult for the justice system to operate in these, in these places because, and say these places being remote communities generally, because not only does everybody know everyone often uh, in these communities, in the same way where I grew up, I grew up in a tiny little place in Scotland, everybody knew everybody, right? Uh, some of these communities, very few people live there. It's a challenge that you can't answer. Like, what do I say to that witness? Like, I can tell you what I have said, which is a whole number of things, like, from, like, bluffing to, you know, sort of like, well, you're going to go up, I'm going to put you up there today, right? When you have no intention of putting them up, uh, to, like, you know, frankly, being on the verge of tears, right, in some of these uh, places, to have to say to people, you're right, I am flying home, right, I am leaving here in two hours, and you're going to have to deal with the aftermath of what I'm asking you to do. I'm not. I don't have to deal with it. And in some communities, the reality of that, and I, if you don't, haven't spent a lot of time in some of these rural communities, I mean, the police can be an hour away, right, or longer. Right? And if people say to you, that's great, well, you know, thanks for telling me to call the police if he comes around again, but the police are 45 minutes away by boat, so your job description as a police officer up there is different, right? Like, it's a horrible thing to say, but often these people are arriving to, to an aftermath, right? Not to stop something happening, right? So when those things are pointed out to you in those communities, you start to have a different perception of justice, I suppose, whatever that is. We also have a different perception of the system. Like the system doesn't work at the best of times in a lot of facets, but it certainly doesn't work there. Right? So how do we change that? And it's a bigger discussion than we'll get into just now. But how does that, how do we change the way we're doing business to try and import this sort of model that clearly doesn't work in those communities? In my experience, in my humble opinion. That may be a question of we keep our existing basic principles of the criminal justice system, just find a better way to operate them. The answer to that might be yes, but it might be no. It might be you have to rethink the other one doing in order to restore the justice model. Sometimes you can't get the right answer to the wrong question. You have to really think more fundamentally about what you're doing. As I say, if, it could be at a certain point you're having a lot of trouble figuring out who's at fault in, in a marital breakup. Say, well, well, let's stop asking the question because we're just not sufficiently equipped to give the answer. And the uh, other thoughts, comments? Everybody okay administratively? You know about your papers? Uh, please try and send an email so I can give you any feedback or uh, review. But by the way, Professor Feinstein is here. Uh, he's given me a great deal of assistance in setting up this course in the first place. It's been uh, quite a journey. So thanks for being here today, Lisa. Thank you for all the help with the course. Okay, see you next week.